What's going on, Pack-A-Day Podcast friends? Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for making the Pack-A-Day Podcast part of your daily routine. Always appreciate you guys a ton. A really quick shout out and reminder, please make sure to check out our... I guess sister stations, if you want to call it, or just our partners in crime, Cheesehead TV and Packer Report. Uh, Both of them allow us to put the Packaday podcast up on their site every single day. So make sure that you are supporting them as well. Just one piece of news from Saturday. Nothing too crazy, but kicker Greg Joseph, uh, who did officially sign with the Packers earlier in the week, we know his contract terms now, and it's a beautiful deal for the Green Bay Packers. So Greg Joseph is going to get paid on his contract one year, $1.2925 million, so $1,292,500. That will only count $1,152,500 against the salary cap because they get a veteran salary cap benefit. And here's the big thing, and here's what you really need to know about the contract. There are zero guaranteed dollars in the contract. No signing bonus, no guarantee part of the base salary, nothing like that. The only thing that he could somewhat get paid potentially without making the team is his $50,000 workout bonus. He has $50,000 in incentives for workouts with the team. If he does those prior to being released, uh, let's say that part of that workout bonus is him going to the OTAs and showing up for weight training and things like that, whatever it might be. Let's say that happens prior to him being released and maybe he gets the full $50,000 bonus by that point. At that point, the $50,000 could count against the salary cap. But if they release him, that is the most that would potentially even remotely cost against the salary cap for the Packers is $50,000. And depending on when they release him and depending if Greg Joseph actually goes to those workouts or not, they may not owe him anything. But that is a great deal for the Green Bay Packers because that means that's legitimately from a salary cap standpoint, when it's as little as 50000 there is zero risk involved for the Green Bay Packers from a salary cap standpoint. So they bring him on the roster. They let him compete with Anders. If he wins, awesome. He's on a one-year vet minimum deal, and basically vet minimum deal, and you're you're totally fine with that. If he doesn't, you release him, and at most, at most, you owe him 50K, which is a drop in the bucket at most in the state of where things are at from an NFL salary cap and cash standpoint right now. So great deal for Green Bay. Good competition. Of course, we talked about the hope is that he pushes Anders Carlson to become that next great Green Bay Packers kicker. That's the hope out of all this. The hope isn't that 30-year-old Greg Joseph is the one that makes the team on a one-year deal. You want the younger guy to turn out. So I've seen a lot of people be like, just cut Anders Carlson. Just cut him, release him, get rid of him. He sucks, whatever. You want Anders to win this. And I'm not saying he should win just because he's younger. I'm not saying he should win because he's a draft pick. If Joseph is better, you're competing this season. You let Greg Joseph make the team. Or if both are terrible, then you need to find a adequate kicker. Maybe the guy that just kicked the, what, 62 yarder or 63, 64, whatever it was in the uh, UFL opener. Is it UFL? I don't even know anymore. There's a new league every single year. Uh, I think it's UFL United Football League, something like that. Uh, But I know he drilled a 60 some yarder to win the game. Whatever it takes. That's, that's what should be the motto for kicker this offseason, whatever it takes. Find one that can make kicks. That's the job. That's the goal. If it's Greg Joseph, though, it's cheap. If it doesn't be, if it doesn't become Greg Joseph, at most, they'll owe him $50,000. So good contract for Green Bay. And that brings us right away to our main topic for today. And that is power rankings. Now, we're just going to be doing NFC power rankings. And this is pre-draft post most of free agency. What I was thinking about as I was doing this, how long have I been doing this now? I don't even remember anymore, but it's been a long time. We've been going on the Pack-A-Day podcast for over 2,000 some days, so it's it's been a hot second. I don't think, and gladly somebody proved me wrong if I have, I don't think in all my years of doing this, writing even before, doing the, the Cheesehead TV stuff, all of it, I don't think I've ever done a uh, Power Rankings article I don't think I've ever done a power rankings podcast, audio, a video, anything. I don't think I have. So you are experiencing, I think, my very first power rankings anything ever. So welcome to that. What I wanted to do and why I wanted to do this is take a look at where the NFC stands right now. We are post-free agency. We are pre-NFL draft. There's only one draft pick 
that I took into consideration when doing these power rankings, and that's Caleb Williams to the Bears. We don't know 100% for certain, but we know about 99.9% for certain that Caleb Williams is going to be a Chicago Bear this upcoming season and beyond. So that's the only draft pick that I took under consideration. I didn't take into consideration draft capital or anything like that. This is just where the roster stands right now from what we know after free agency prior to the draft, except for Caleb Williams. So let's start with number 16, and we'll go from 16 to 1, NFC only, and where these teams stand, in my opinion. And just to be crystal clear on this, I did this without the view or help of any other power rankings. I did look after at ESPNs just because I was curious after the fact. So I will compare them to where they rank on NFC or on ESPN's power rankings in the NFC at the end of this. But I did this with no lifelines, no nothing. Just looked at the rosters, put everything together, and this is what I came up with. So roast me in the comments if you'd like on anything that you think I'm too far off on. Number 16 is the Washington Commanders, who were 4-13 and a season ago. Right now, we know they brought in Dan Quinn as their new head coach. They're going to end up with a rookie quarterback, but we don't know who that's going to be, and we don't know, as of this point, if that rookie quarterback is going to be able to come in and contribute right away, at least in a successful capacity. They have Marcus Mariota, who they brought in as the bridge quarterback. I'm sure their hope is that they don't ever have to start Marcus Mariota, but we don't know what that's ultimately going to look like. They bring in Zach Ertz as their primary tight end. He barely played, and he's very significantly on the decline at this point in his career. I do love the fact that they have uh, Dotson and Terry McLaurin at wide receiver, two phenomenal wide receivers on the outside. They bring in Austin Eckler, but he's getting a little bit on the higher side in age. The offensive line is not super impressive. You're bringing in a young quarterback in an organization that doesn't exactly have a stellar reputation, although I think their new ownership group has done an okay job, at least trying to start to change that culture around. New head coach, new quarterback, and a roster that needs a lot of improvements. And their big superpower that they've had forever has been that defensive line, the Jonathan Allen and uh, uh, Sweats that went to Chicago and then Chase Young. And like they've had that incredible uh, Deron Payne was the other one. Those four guys uh, along the defensive line, that was like their one superpower. It's like, man, it is a pain to go against those four every single game that you have to play because they can just wreck havoc up front. Well, gone is Montez Sweat, who they traded to Chicago last season, and gone is Chase Young, who they traded to San Francisco last season, and who's now a member of the New Orleans Saints. But that defensive front is no longer the same. And what Washington did in free agency is the most bizarre thing that you could do for where Washington is right now on their path to trying to become a relevant team again. They went out and spent big money on off-ball linebackers, two of them, and one of them who is old and not on their timeline whatsoever. And I get it. Bobby Wagner played with uh, with uh, Dan Quinn in Seattle, and they have that connection. It's fine. It's not a huge deal. But like those are their big you know free agent signings. Zach Ertz, who is declining, You've got Austin Eckler, who is old, Bobby Wagner, old, and then Frankie Louvu, who I really like. You guys know how much I love Frankie Louvu, but that's not enough. I don't see how this team takes a significant step. They s- trade Sam Howell away for basically pennies on the dollar. They're going to draft a rookie quarterback, but this is not the team nor the structure for a rookie quarterback to come in and have success with right away. So for me, Washington Commanders, number 16, I am predicting them as of right now to finish last in the NFC. And of course, if they grab, which we know they're going to grab a quarterback, if they grab a quarterback and they that quarterback is really, really good, that could change very quickly. But where the roster is at right now, prior to the draft, I'm putting them at number 16. Carolina Panthers, number 15, two and 15 a season ago. Uh, they'd go get Dan Canella, Dave Canellis, excuse me, as their new head coach. Bryce Young will enter year two. They do really solidify the offensive line going out and giving massive contracts to both Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis. They trade for Deontay Johnson from Pittsburgh. They grab a ton of reinforcements on that defense. Jadavian Clowney, Ashawn Robinson, uh, Clavion Chasen, uh, DJ Wanham, Josie Jewell, Jordan Fuller, Dane Jackson. It's not like this huge, super-powered group of players, but they definitely got some reinforcements for the defense. They still have Derek Brown, who's really, really good. This roster is still not in a good situation at all. And to add every insult to injury is the fact that they 
one, could have had C.J. Stroud instead of Bryce Young a season ago, and two, should have had the number one pick in the draft. And even if they if they had drafted, um, obviously they drafted C.J. Stroud, then they wouldn't have had the, the number one pick because they traded up for it. But you get my point. Either they should have had C.J. Stroud or they should have had the number one pick in the draft and had the opportunity to you know draft Caleb Williams. Instead, they do the horrible trade up they grabbed the wrong quarterback in Bryce Young, at least as of this point, and it's going to be a really tough chase for for Bryce Young to catch uh, C.J. Stroud for the remainder of his career, just with the start that Stroud is already off to. And now they don't have a first round pick. Plus, they gave up a bunch of other stuff, including D.J. Moore, uh, you know, to the to the Bears as well. It, it's a it's a horrible state of affairs in Carolina. I don't think they've done enough to really sig- you know significantly alter their roster. I do think their defense can be better enough with Derek Brown and, you know, being a a menace in the middle of that defense to win some games with their defense and hope that with a new head coach that Bryce Young takes a little bit of a step in year two. We'll see how they can augment that roster in the draft. And this easily could still be a team that finishes worse than the NFC. That would not surprise me at all, but I'm going Carolina Panthers at number 15. Number 14, I'm going New York Giants. They lose Wink Martindale, their defensive coordinator, which their defense was the one good thing they had going for them. They still have Daniel Jones. They bring in Drew Locke as the backup. Either way, nobody's afraid of Daniel Jones. Nobody's afraid of Drew Locke. Saquon Barkley's gone in his Devin Singletary. I'm not breaking any news here. Devin Singletary is not Saquon Barkley. They lose Xavier McKinney to the Green Bay Packers. That's not going to help their defense. Their offense right now, this is their, their core offense. Daniel Jones, Devin Singletary, Jalen Hyatt, Slayton on the other side, and then Wondell Robinson in the slot. And then maybe, maybe Darren Waller, who is currently in the process of considering retirement. They don't have a great offensive line. Their defense is still really good. They should still have a very good defense. But again, they lose Martindale. They lose Xavier McKinney. They're not going to have an offense that's going to be able to put up enough points. To me, Giants, 14th. They were 6-11 and 11 a season ago. All right, number 13 on my list is the Arizona Cardinals. 4-13 and 13 last year. I think the biggest thing why I expect them to take a little bit of a jump is they should have Kyler Murray for the entire season unless he gets hurt during the season, which it's tough to predict who will get hurt and who won't. But they did not have Kyler Murray for the entirety of last season. I do think him coming back, uh, hopefully healthy. I still think he can be a good quarterback in this league. I think that will help at least some. Hollywood Brown is gone. They made no real major additions to that roster. The defense is in really rough shape. They don't have any premium players, like almost on the team. Like they are extremely lacking in top end talent. It is a very barren roster. Now in the draft, they have a early draft pick. That number four spot is sort of the almost perfect spot to be right now because there's four quarterbacks and every team that can't get in the top three is going to be fighting. Every team that needs a quarterback, I should say, it's going to be fighting for that number four spot or they can just stick and take the best non quarterback on their board. So they're going to have some options. And if they get a, you know, Malik neighbors, that is going to be a premium player. I think that is going to help their, their team tremendously from day one, but whatever they do, they should have the ability to strike it rich a little bit in the draft. But right now a little bit barren on all sides, no, no great premium players, but I do think the return of Kyler will help somewhat. So they come in at number 13 on my list. Number 12, this is where it might be a little bit. These next couple might be a little surprising, but this is where I'm going. Number 12, New Orleans Saints. Nine and eight a season ago. I am not a Derek Carr believer. And I think that situation, Derek Carr in New Orleans, it already in year one had its very rocky moments. I think it's only going to get worse this season. Elvin Kamara is getting older. Ryan Ramchek, their stud right tackle, may not be able to play the entirety of the season because his leg is not you know, um, healing the way that they were expecting it to. They do have some players on defense. They get Chase Young in on defense. They still have Cameron Jordan, Demario Davis, Marshawn Lattimore, Paulson Adebo, Carl Granderson. I do think that defense is going to be able to help them, but I don't think the offense is good enough. I know Chris Olave is phenomenal, but outside of that, it gets a little bit shaky. Like I said, not a Derek Carr believer. It's going to be too much on that defense and one or two injuries to that defense. I'm also not a Chase Young believer and Cameron Jordan, Demario Davis getting a little bit on the older side. I just don't think there's enough there. So I'm going number 12 on my list, New Orleans Saints. And then number 11 might be another surprising one to people. I'm going Tampa Bay Buccaneers, number 11. They bring back Jordan Whitehead as sort of their big free agent signing, which is a medium-sized free agent signing. They showed some faith in Baker Mayfield by giving him a, a bigger contract. I'm a pretty big Baker Mayfield believer, 
but I do think there's a limit to what he can do. And I think basically this past season, we saw, I think probably the best out of Baker Mayfield that we're going to see. I don't think there's another step on top of that for Baker, but we're going to have to see what he can do in year two in Tampa. You love the Evans Godwin combo, but that's, what's going to have to sort of supercharge the entirety of their offense. They don't have a great running game. They don't have any real other weapons. Their offensive line is okay. Tristan Wirfs is phenomenal. Levante David's getting older. Now their defense is anchored by Vita Vea and Antoine Winfield. That's good. They're both really good players. And, and of course, Levante David, even at his age, can still play. But I don't think they have enough. They trade away Carlton Davis to uh, Detroit. I think the roster's good. And Todd Bowles has done such a tremendous job coaching that team. That's the one reason I probably could have put them a little bit higher is because I do have a lot of faith in Todd Bowles and what he can do as a head coach. But I think their roster is thin, meaning a couple injuries to one or two of these guys. And I think they're they're It's like a house of cards just kind of falls apart. So I'm putting Tampa Bay nine and eight a season to go at number 11 on my list. Number 10, I'm going Minnesota Vikings. They were seven and 10 last season. Gone is Kirk Cousins. Their offense right now that they're going to sort of, you know, try to base everything around Sam Darnold, that quarterback, their offensive line is very, very good. That is the one thing that gives me a lot of faith. And then they've got a, really great weapons, right? It's the Sam Darnold piece that is giving you pause and cause for concern. Aaron Jones steps in at running back for Alexander Madison. That's going to be a huge upgrade for them, assuming Jones can stay healthy. Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison, in my opinion, one of the best, if not the best one-two punch at wide receiver in the NFL. TJ Hawkinson has proved very valuable for them at that tight end spot. Their, their weapons are very, very good. The offensive line is very, very good. It's just what can you get out of Sam Darnold or do they go and get a quarterback and then what do you get out of that quarterback? The defense will be good. Like I said before uh, in the NFC North update episode, I really like what they did on defense. Jonathan Grenard, I think, is going to be a big-time addition. Andrew Van Ginkle is going to be a big-time addition. And we know that Vikings defense is going to be super aggressive. I still think this Minnesota team is annoying, but that quarterback spot is just such a huge question mark at this point. I don't put Sam Darnold in the upper, you know, in the, the category of quarterbacks that is going to be able to put together a, a playoff caliber run, even with the weapons needed around him. And I just think Minnesota is a little bit in no man's land. Now, well, if they go and get their young quarterback in it, JJ McCarthy or Drake may, and they prove to be a good player that can change things because they do have a lot of the other pieces and they are set up to bring in a rookie quarterback and have the pieces around him in order to succeed. And they have the two first round draft picks. They got future draft picks to use. All of this screams to me that they believe they can go and get a quarterback in the draft that can play right now while also still keeping this window open with the Jeffersons and the Addisons and those sort of things. But if they can't get that quarterback and it's Sam Darnold or that quarterback doesn't work out, they're just in no man's land because you have a roster that's ready to compete with a quarterback that's not. And that is one of the worst places to be in. All right, number nine on my list, Seattle Seahawks. Mike McDonald takes over for Pete Carroll. This offense right now, Geno Smith at quarterback, Kenneth Walker at running back, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and Jackson Smith and Jigba at wide receiver and Noah Fant at tight end. Okay, but a little bit shaky on the offensive line. Their defense two extremely talented corners in Tariq Woolen and Devin Witherspoon. And then they're a little bit lacking, in my opinion, on the defensive side of the ball. But Mike McDonald, also a genius on the defensive side of the ball, so that should help that out. I think they're a well-rounded team. I think they're a good team. I think they have every right to challenge for a playoff spot. I think they have every right to give the Rams and the 49ers a tough time. But I think they ultimately fall a little bit short. I still see a little bit of a ceiling there around uh, like a 9-8 and eight sort of team for Seattle. Could you move them maybe a couple spots up on this list? I think you could, and I wouldn't have any major issues with it, but I put them at number nine. I think with the new coaching staff, some holes on the defense, and still just kind of a, like I, th I think a ceiling with Geno Smith, even though I, I think he's had a really nice couple seasons. For me, they come in number nine on my list. Number eight on my list. I'm going Chicago Bears, seven and 10 a season ago. I think one of the things that we do have to at least acknowledge a little bit, despite how atrocious they started, a 7-10 and 10 record for that team last year, especially the way they started, not the worst record in the world. They did start to piece some things together after that Montez Sweat trade, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, and now you enter Caleb Williams. And it's hard to imagine, it's really hard for me to imagine, where they go and they get, you know, Keenan Allen and DeAndre Swift, 
They still have, obviously, DJ Moore. They bring in Gerald Everett. It's hard for me to imagine that this Bears team, bringing in Caleb Williams and moving on from Justin Fields, is worse. Like, 7-10 and 10 should sort of be their floor. And if Caleb Williams comes in and does show that he can play right away, this team can be better sooner rather than later. And I think they are a real legitimate threat if Caleb Williams comes in and plays at a high level, even just a good level, not even a high level, but a good level, to be a playoff team in, in 2024. I think that is within the realm of possibility. I also think extremely highly of a, as a player uh, of Caleb Williams and what he can do. I, I, I have not many concerns. I know people are concerned. I said, I've watched every single snap of his from uh, this past season. My concerns are very limited with Caleb Williams. I think he's going to be able to come in and play pretty darn well, pretty darn fast. But their offense is there. Darnell Wright continues to improve uh, that offensive line. I thought he was fantastic a season ago, their first round pick from last year. Montez Sweat, the defense totally changed when he came in on defense. Jalen Johnson is back. And that secondary, Jalen Johnson, Jaquan Brisker, Kyler Gordon, Tyreek Stevenson, that is a, it's going to be fun watching for the foreseeable future, like this super young Packers wide receiver core against that super young Bears secondary. And it's just ch- both sides, just chock full of really young, super talented players. That is going to be a really fun matchup. But that secondary for Chicago is fantastic and young and is only going to get better. So I, I like that Chicago Bears team as much as I hate to say it. I still don't think they're going to take this massive jump. I still don't have them in the playoffs. I have them at number eight, but I think they're going to be in the conversation and I do expect them to be better than their seven and 10 record a season ago. Number seven on my list, Atlanta Falcons, seven and 10 a season ago as well. Raheem Morris takes over as head coach. The big thing here, they went seven and 10, beat Green Bay earlier in the season, and they did so without any sort of legitimate quarterback play whatsoever. And say what you want about Kirk Cousins and what you can do with him as the main starter and things like that. And he's getting older, coming off the Achilles. There's probably going to be a little bit of a step back for him. He still is a legitimate quarterback and certainly a big step ahead of what Desmond Ritter was and that entire Falcons quarterback crew was a season ago. Bajan Robinson is a stud at running back. They now have Drake London, Rondale Moore, and Darnell Mooney at wide receiver. Kyle Pitts still at tight end. A really solid offensive line. The defense is in need of work. Grady Jarrett's still there. Jesse Bates is there. AJ Terrell is there. And then it's in need, like I said, in need of some improvements. But the reason I have them higher on my list and number seven is because I'm not a believer in the rest of the NFC South. Panthers, uh, Saints, and um, what? Panthers, Saints, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Buccaneers, sorry, are all on my list already. I had Panthers at 15. Saints at 12 and Bucks at 11. Somebody's got to win the division. I do think with bringing in Kirk Cousins and uh, putting some talent around him, I think they're going to have a fun offense. And I think they do make the playoffs. I think they win the NFC South. And that's why they ultimately come in at number seven on my list. Number six, the LA Rams, who were 10 and seven a season ago. I would have had them higher on this list, I think, except uh, for the loss of, I don't know, maybe the greatest defender of our generation and Aaron Donald. That is a huge, huge loss for the Rams. He set up so much of what they do on defense by being just an absolute freak on the interior of the defensive line. Without that, it's going to be a totally different defense in LA. Now they bring in some really fun players. Jonah Jackson's going to really help that offensive line. Cameron Curl, I thought was one of the best value free agent signings in all of uh in all of free agency in the NFL. They bring back or bring in Darius Williams as a corner and Tredavious White from the Bills as a corner, trying to get that secondary back on track. Matthew Stafford at quarterback, Kyron Williams at running back, Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua dynamic at wide receiver. Tyler Higby and they pick up Colby Parkinson as their number two tight end. Their offensive line with Jonah Jackson is getting better. I think this is a team that puts up points. I, their defense is what scares me. And like I said, with no Aaron Donald, it's going to be a lot different for them. And they're about to experience life without a Hall of Famer on the front of their defense. That's going to change some things. So for me, number six, like I said, would have been higher had it not been for for Aaron Donald. Number five on my list, Dallas Cowboys, 12 and five a season ago. The big thing here is they have not done anything this offseason. And they've lost Tony Pollard at running back. Dorrance Armstrong along the defensive line, Tyler Biotish on their offensive line, and Tyron Smith on the offensive line. They also released Leighton Vander Esch. Their only real add 
is the Eric is Eric Kendricks, that linebacker who is getting on the older side. Mike Zimmer comes in to be the defensive coordinator. That should help things a little bit. I do think they still have a very good core, CD Lamb, Dak Prescott. I think they're going to be able to be good. I like there's just not that many teams that have the talent Micah Parsons that Dallas does. But a team that went 12 and 5 got worse, in my opinion, and is going to have to, you know, and, and didn't even win a playoff game a season ago. I still think they're good, but I couldn't put them any higher than number five on my list. The other thing, too, is you've got that Dak Prescott situation where he's set to become a free agent next year. That could cause some, I, I don't know. I'm just really, really interested. No, no movement for Dallas. Dak Prescott's going to be a free agent. They lose in the first round of the playoffs. It feels a little bit like it could combust at some point. Maybe it doesn't, and that core is still really good, but I'm watching that team with a very close eye. They come in at number five on my list. Number four, Philadelphia Eagles, 11 and six a season ago. Howie Roseman is playing Madden franchise mode. He is just swapping players in and out, left and right, in our Devontae Parker, Saquon Barkley, Bryce Huff, Devin White, and Chauncey Gardner Johnson. Jason Kelsey retired. That is a huge loss for them. Hassan Reddick traded away. Now they replaced him with Bryce Huff. It will, maybe Huff is, you know, similar from a pass rush standpoint, but still losing Reddick is a, a loss. That offense, pretty supercharged. Jalen Hurts at quarterback, Saquon Barkley at running back now. AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Devontae Parker at wide receiver, Dallas Goddard at tight end. Even with the loss of Jason Kelsey, to me, that is a very, very good. Off, excuse me, very, very good offensive line still. I I think that offense is going to be able to put up significant points. However, we saw Philly collapse a season ago, and that's something that they're going to have to figure out because they completely just fell off the map in the second half of last season. Now you bring in a bunch of players, but that isn't always the way to build a team. Like It kind of harkens back to the dream team when they signed Michael Vick and Colin Jenkins and what was it, uh, Nande Asamoah and just like had this unreal offseason in Philly and never amounted to anything. And sometimes you add a lot of those players and now you have to integrate a bunch more players into your team and those things don't always go seamlessly. So it's fun to watch Howie Roseman play on franchise mode, Madden mode, and just go out and sign a bunch of people. But how does that look in practice? On paper, it looks pretty good. I'm excited. Defense, Jalen Carter, Bryce Huff, Josh Sweat, Darius Slay, James Bradbury, Chauncey, Chauncey Garner Johnson. The talent is there. But how do you reconcile a complete slide at the end of last year and just a complete, I don't want to say maybe implosion, but just everything fell apart at the end of last year and then combine that with a lot of turnover on the roster? This is another team where, like Dallas, I'm just sort of monitoring, really want to see what they can be, but there's no question about it. Philly and Dallas, a ton of talent. There's also going to be a lot of expectations and a lot of pressure on both of those teams. Number three on my list, Detroit Lions, 12-5 and five a season ago. They lose Jonah Jackson, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, Josh Reynolds. Remember, though, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson barely played last year. And they get Kevin Zeitler, who will be a great replacement for Jonah Jackson. Marcus Davenport has an edge. DJ Reader, a huge upgrade along the defensive line. They get Carlton Davison from Tampa Bay. They also get a Meek Robertson from the Raiders. This is still a very young, very talented core. Jared Goff has been really good for Detroit. I know we don't always like to admit it or call it out, but... He deserves a lot of credit for really resurrecting his career after his time in LA. I mean, they basically threw Jared Goff in that deal for Matt Stafford and Goff's been every bit the legitimate starter in Detroit that they need him to be. Uh, now, how high he can get, we'll see. He went to a Super Bowl early in his career when he wasn't even very good at that point with the Rams. I don't know. Like, I, I still think there's there's something there. Like, I think he, he I don't know. Can he win them the Super Bowl? That's That's the big question at this point. The big thing is they retain both of their coordinators, which was completely unexpected, and getting both of them back is going to be huge. They still have everything they need. They're still super hungry. I do think this kind of needs to be the year that they take that, and they took a huge jump last year, so I'm not saying they didn't, but like, if you're going to win the Super Bowl, if you need to, if you want to be that team, you're going to have to do that sooner rather than later, but their window's still open. They're still super hungry. They're still really good. They come in at number three on my list in the NFC, and that brings us to number two, your Green Bay Packers, nine and eight a season ago. We all know, I will go through it quick, lose John Runyon Jr., Darnell Savage, Josh Nyman, Aaron Jones, David Bakhtiari, but in comes Xavier McKinney and Josh Jacobs. 
super young roster. The expectations is, are that they take another jump this upcoming season. I think the big question mark here is how do they deal with expectations? Had none a season ago, have all the expectations now. Jordan Love, what is he going to do? Now he's in the MVP conversation. Like This is a massive jump in expectations for Green Bay. But everything's there that they need. We know the draft picks that they have coming up, even though we didn't include that in this portion of the the power rankings. But getting two guys like Xavier McKinney and Josh Jacobs, and then also knowing that the core of this team is only getting better, to me, it's a significant step. I put them at number two on my power rankings. Number one, the San Francisco 49ers. Still there. Listen, they've had an interesting offseason. They lose Eric Armstead. They lose Chase Young. They lose Javon Kinlaw. They lose Cleland Farrell. Dre Greenlaw is injured. That's going to be a huge injury for them. What's going to happen with Brandon Ayuk? Does he stay on the team? Do they ultimately pull the trigger and trade him? Do they figure out a contract? They don't add much. Leonard Floyd, Devondre Campbell, Malik Collins. This has not been a big free agency for San Francisco. So I do think they've gotten a little bit worse. But this has still been the pretty significant class of the NFC for some time now. And until a team dethrones them, to me, they earn the spot at number one, and I'm not willing to move them off it quite yet. I do wonder, like, usually this is, like, we've seen San Francisco, the Kyle Shanahan offense, and those sort of things. Like, it's kind of had a pretty significant run. The team start just figuring it out, and and maybe this San Francisco team starts just kind of falling back to the middle of the pack a little bit more. This is another one that I'm intrigued by, but as of right now, I still have to put them at number one on my list. So just to recap, 16 Washington Commanders, 15 Carolina Panthers, 14 New York Giants, 13 Arizona Cardinals, 12 Saints, 11 Bucks, 10 Minnesota Vikings, 9 Seattle Seahawks, 8 Bears, 7 Falcons. I don't know why I'm doing some of them with city names and some not, but 6 LA Rams, 5 Dallas Cowboys, 4 Eagles, 3 Lions, 2 Packers, and 1 are the San Francisco 49ers. Here's where ESPN was. Like I said, I looked at it after the fact, and we'll compare it to mine. ESPN had the Panthers at 16. I had them at 15. They had the Cardinals at 15. I had them at 13. They had the Commanders at 14. I had them at 16. Giants at 13. I had them at 14. Vikings at 12. I had them at 10. Saints at 11. I had them at 12. Bears at 10. I had them at 8. Seahawks at 9. They had them at 9. Falcons at eight. I had them at seven. Our biggest difference, they had the Buccaneers at seven. I had them at 11. Rams at six for both of us. They had the Packers at five. I had them at two. They had the Cowboys at four. I had them at five. Eagles at three. I had them at four. 49ers at two. I had them at one. And they had the Lions at one. I had them at three. So not too big of differences. The the Bucks four spots apart, the Packers three spots apart, but everyone else was one or two spots apart. So not anything crazy aggressive on my end. Apparently higher than the consensus on the Packers, lower than the consensus on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's going to do it for me today. Hope you enjoy the episode. I'll be right back here tomorrow with a brand new one as I am 365 days a year. Make sure to give the podcast a follow, like, subscribe, comment. Give those five-star reviews if you're listening on the audio side. Check out the Packaday Podcast YouTube memberships. Whatever you're into, the world's your oyster. Hope you're appreciating the Packers content. I know I appreciate doing it. Shout out to Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Broadad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. See you soon. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.